Well, I guess, uh, first off, thanks uh, to Machine and Mining and uh, uh, for the invite. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, nice to meet you all. Um, great event. Um, the title of the talk is Data Mining, Mining Data. Now, I didn't come up with that title, so I can't claim responsibility for it, but I kind of like it's a symmetrical and you know, we're all in the mining industry, we should be good at extracting value from the ground. Uh, it's good to talk about ways we can get a few little nuggets out of, uh, out of the information that, uh, that's available to us. Um, it's going to be a bit broader and talk a little more broader in school than just mining data because uh, I'll touch on the data itself. Um, you know, it's hard to extract value from data that isn't relevant or isn't uh, is another quality that you can extract value from that whole garbage in, garbage out thing. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the importance of the actual data itself and, and basically putting these pieces together, having you know high quality data combined with an intelligent way to extract value from it. Um, you can really get a uh, you know, thing going there. So uh, I'll uh, speak a little bit about uh, about myself. You know, basically what uh, point there about uh, just giving some background of uh, uh, on myself and some history that's relevant. Uh, I went to University of well, first of all, my name is Vince Gary, from UGI Geoscience, and uh, went to University of Waterloo as a hydrogeologist. So I was interested in groundwater. And, I was in a co-op program, which uh, gave the opportunity to get in the workforce rather quickly and uh, find out very quickly if you, if you made the right choice, <laughs> yeah, maybe a good career choice, yes or no. But I found myself as um, you know, pretty much a first-year student, very green, uh, uh, you know, only with about one or two like, earth science classes under my belt. Uh, my co-op job, I'm responsible for supervising a drill rig and logging the core that's coming out of the ground. And uh, you know, it's a bit of a, bit of a challenge for, uh, for someone green to be doing that. Um, but I also struggled with the, the descriptive, um, you know, descriptive classification schemes. It was like a groundwater project, glacial sediment sort of thing. So, you know, is this a sandy silt or is this a silty sand? You know, is this is this a grayish, uh, you know, brownish green clay or a greenish brown clay? You know, that, that kind of thing. And, and I noticed over that four month work term that the way I was describing and classifying things in a in a subjective, descriptive way was evolving. And I found that kind of comical because the, you know, the sediments below my feet probably hadn't changed since the last ice age, but in four months the way I was describing it was changing. And to complicate things further, there was another green student following out in another drill rig who probably wasn't describing the same dog in the same way I was. And uh, he was colorblind, so I don't know how he was doing it. <laughs> I don't know how he survived in that whole you know, grayish brown, greenish brown thing. So, um, so that was interesting. So uh, long story short is you know, people see things in different ways perceive things differently, describe it differently, and um, I was getting a bit frustrated with the wishy-washy, subjective, descriptive um, process that I was going through. I was thinking, isn't there a way we can just measure it? Can we just not measure the rock and get away from this you know, descriptive thing? Um, you know, across the mining industry where there's uh, geologists flying in and out of remote camps, um, you know, there's, there's uh, properties that are changing hands with different teams, there's different drilling campaigns over the years. Uh, and, and it's very challenging to try and put this into a model. You know, we've had some projects where there's 187 rock codes, and there's no way there's 187 different rock types. Right? Um, so this happens all the time. So uh, my first exposure to taking in situ measurements would have been back in, in this uh, first year university co-op job, where uh, this guy backs a truck up to the to the drill hole and uh, drops some sensors down the hole, and I'm Wow, I'm looking, he's got this laptop and there's like data just streaming in. It's like, you know, this continuous profile. You take measurements every few centimeters of a few different parameters, and I can right away, I can see, wow, that's correlating to what we're seeing in the ground. And uh, so I saw right away that that was a way where you could, um, you know, take the holes that were logged by different people and have a consistent measurement across and then start, you know, saying, oh, what this guy described as, a, as something, I described something else. Well, then you could see distinct patterns um, because the data was so dense and it's continuous. You could see marker horizons. And, well, this is the same layer layers over here, not that kind of stuff. So that opened my eyes. And then uh, uh, my actual next job was uh, working for the Geological Survey of Canada in the portal and geophysics department. So I, I became that guy that was taking measurements down hall and, uh, and applied it more to mining. So uh, different mineral deposits got to uh, you know, to around all over Canada, do underground mines, you know, gold, base metals, uh, diamonds, um, so very great exposure. And one thing was consistent that we're just measuring properties, we're measuring contrasts, they all mean something. You know, sometimes it maps to alterations, sometimes mineralization, sometimes there's geometrical properties. You know, there's, there's um, you know, we're really measuring things that relate to things across the entire mining, you know, the mining uh, life cycle and uh, the different disciplines. 
so I guess shortly after that, I decided that um, you know I thought, wow, this is uh, you know there's some growth in this future. I think this this is going to be you know this is going to be the future. The oil and gas industry does it all the time. Prior to any adoption in the mining industry, this is going to be a growth year. So I thought I was really smart and you know starting the company and saying, ah, you know, I'm on a good trend here. I'm going to catch the wave for everyone else. And then shockingly, you know, it's, it's been about 20 years now, and I'm shocked at the uh, adoption rate, how how slow it is. Uh, you know, we get stats on how many meters are drilled in Canada every year, and uh, we know how much we've measured, and we know that there aren't that many other people doing it, um, that guy that he's doing it. And uh, you know, we're thinking, you know, for uh, oil and gas industry, about a uh, hundred percent of holes that are drilled, we collect information from those holes. On the on the mining side, it's it's you know, it's probably somewhere between two and five percent of, of exploration and deposit appraisal holes are measured, and we see that as uh, you know, the drill hole. The whole entire reason for drilling is to get information, to understand what's there, and I think it's an opportunity lost. We think the money that's spent just you know, Swiss cheese in the ground to just describe the rock and not take some some more measurements, not take it a step further. It's uh, it's, a, it's an access point that's been paid for. You know, it's like I don't know. It's, I think of an analogy. It's like you you know you pay for your child to, to go to school, but say you're only allowed to go to one class. You know, there's there's so much more you can learn, so much more you can do. You know, so anyhow, uh, enough about the background. Um, uh, but basically, what you know, what what we've been doing at DGI was, you know, it was obvious from the beginning that the data can add value, uh, but there was a lack of adoption. We have one or two ways to go about this. You can either say, I'll just sit around and wait till people adopt, and you know, hopefully the adoption rate will go up because it makes sense from my perspective. Or you could be an active participant and say, how can we change things? What can we do? Can we just knock down all those barriers and? Um, and so we heard all the excuses for not not acquiring this data, and we basically made a list, and one by one we're, we're tackling those. And uh, the first big one, um, we kind of already worked on the data consistency. We knew innately that you have to be able to acquire consistent data. You have to be able to measure data from one more hole and go to another and have the exact same response and the same rock type kind of thing. So that one we sort of, uh, you know, it's uh, it's not an easy thing to resolve, but you know, we've. Uh, QAQC practices, you know, calibration, all that kind of stuff. There's uh, the process for that. But one of the first things we really tackled was extracting value from the data. You know, every project we work on, we've got a data-rich um, source of, of information. We've got multiple parameters, continuous measurements, and we can have millions of data points for some projects. The last thing you want to do is just dump that on, a, on someone's desk and say, here, use some data, good luck. You know, <laughs> I don't think we've got many people hiring us, we just increase their workload and don't have any value. So we really focused, um, you know, there's been a lot of advancements. You know, we didn't invent any of this stuff. There's, there's all kinds of advancements across the world in the world of big data and neural networking and cluster analysis and traditional statistics. There's, there's so many things you can do. We just focused on what's the best way to extract value from these data sets, these, these data rich uh, requirements. So I'm excited that I better, I better move on. Um, so a bit of background, uh, you know, the need for change. Um, you know, obviously there's declining mineral resources and, Increasing operational costs, um, generating margins. So there's demand um, more so than ever, I think, right now. Um, you know, demand for uh, workflows and technology to improve productivity and decrease risk. I think there's going to be we're talking about risk, I believe, in the next talk. So um, yeah, cost overruns, uh, production delays, or lower yields often due to lack of deposit understanding. There's uh, you know, a number of examples. I'll you know, pick one off the top of my head. Uh, I was talking to an engineering company that. Uh, designed a mill for a specific, um, you know, specific rock type. You know, there's a specification. The rock that's coming out of the ground. They built the mill for that specification. Not sure exactly how much it cost. You know, two billion dollars or something like that. Um, and when it was said and done, the mill was built. The rocks coming out of the ground did not match the specs for what the mill was built for. Right. So, um, you know, a lot of problems there. First off, you know, they're counting on the money, <laughs> counting the money the mill is producing to pay for the mill. Uh, now it's going to take a lot longer, but um, the other issue is, is uh, you know, that I'm pretty sure that the rock in the ground didn't change. You know, it's probably been the same for millions of years, so what went wrong there? Uh, you know, do we just take a handful of samples? I actually don't know what went wrong, but I, I just know that we should have been able to get that right you know, in some way, shape, or form. And, uh, you know, if you take, uh, you can't just take, uh, it, it, these deposits are complex, they're not all the same, they're not uniform around the world. Um, if you're lucky, you've got a pretty homogeneous cool <coughs> deposit, but, uh, they're complex, and if you just take um, you know a handful or a dozen samples and build this huge mill based on that assumption, um, you know, you're, there's, there's a serious problem there. Um, so what you know what we're proposing is is taking some uh, relatively low cost measurements that actually map variability that will give you an indication whether something's homogeneous or not. 
so again, sort of similar. Uh, you know, this applies a bit to uh, geometallurgy as well. I, I, I went, I attended the geometallurgy talks at the PEC last year, and uh, across the board, some great presentations. Uh, but the common theme was the geomet tests are expensive. You have to drill, you know, large diameter core. Uh, each test is, you know, tens of thousands of dollars or something. I don't know the exact numbers, but they're expensive. And it's common sense that oh, if it's an expensive test, you want to you want to do as, as few as you can get away with, kind of thing. But they all agreed uh, across the board in the geometallurgy industry that one of their biggest challenges was not being able to map variability, understand the variability, because they're taking you know, one sample here and sending off a lot of another sample here. You don't know what's going on in between. So getting that representative sample. So one of the things we've tried to do is, is um, basically, I'm not trying to do, but some successful case studies on this, is, uh, is basically use, use some low-cost, uh, multi-parameter data to map variability and, and basically correlate it to some of these uh, Parameters. Okay, so the idea is like a lot of these costly surprises could be practically minimized or avoided if uh, accurate models are created from higher resolution quantitative data. Uh, you know, and in the end, you know, I, I don't think we're acquiring the metrics that the granular required to make informed decisions. If you're trying to optimize a mill and you've just got this random data points and not a not a uh, complete <coughs> So basically, I tried to make this as simple as possible. Like, what are we proposing? What are we doing? And it's really let's obtain some richer quantitative measures. That's the data acquisition part. Make sure it's quanti there's, there's a whole bunch of talk about hours on that, but it has to be consistent, quantitative, multi-parameter, um, high resolution, like not not too spaced out measurements, um, and apply some robust data analytics. Uh, again, you can't just press a button and spew up stats. You really have to verify the data. There's a bunch of steps involved. Um, and then dynamically generate 3D models. And the technology exists. Uh, you know, this 3D modeling software, this, it, it, you, could, you could iterate models pretty quickly. And you just have to, to feed it with, um, with consistent quantitative information. And then a bunch of benefits of already alluded to there. So this is just, uh, I'm not going to talk much about this, but I'm just, uh, I haven't really touched on what we actually measure. So, this is a world of like physical rock properties. We're just you know you're able to just scan take electrical properties. What's the density of the rock? What's the uh, speed of sound through the rock? I won't get into any technical details, but the idea being multiple parameters, continuous scanning, and any available borehole that's open. Uh, we can also image the inside of borehole, so uh, you know that's important for uh, you know understanding the structure, the direction. We see a feature within a borehole and know exactly what direction it's facing. So I have one quick example to show you there. It's always good to know where the borehole is going. And then so that's the input data and then there's let's let's crunch it through and extract value. So those of you who don't know what televisions look like, facing a camera pointing to a conical shape mirror, you're imaging the inside of the borehole. So this is the inside of the borehole unwrapped. That's the casing. And then that's the same data draped over a cylinder. So these are the types of things they've been available for a long time. Uh, but uh, you know some people aren't aware of them and you basically to see exactly where the fracture frequency is, uh, what, what the direction of these features are, and it's for pitch shell designs, all kinds of applications on, on that side of the mining industry. Did, so how, how small a detail can you get on that? Is this digital? You could. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a trade off between uh, speed and resolution. So typically, uh, you know, sort of a standard, we can go, go much higher resolution, but standard for productivity, uh, you're looking at about maybe a two millimeter by two millimeter like pixel size. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you want a higher detail, like you want to zoom in on a vein with invisible gold or something, you could you could crank it up and just go a bit slower. That would get you about you know, scanning speed close to three meters a minute. So just a constant scan, three meters a minute at about two two millimeter pixel resolution. So if you were imaging, could you see that as you're doing it? You yeah, yeah, yeah So you could slow it down. You could absolutely. Adjust. Yeah, you could go back. I'm interested in this. Let's slow it down and let's uh, let's take a closer look. You could definitely do that. Yeah, it's all. If you're, it's, you're running it from a from a computer, you say this is what the resolution I want, and then the speed depends on the resolution. Um, Do you have any problems by having different resolutions and different poles, or is there a baseline no. resolution? No, no. It, it becomes a reference image that you can view at any time. Um, you can come back and uh, you do one whole different resolution. Basically, it, it's what are you going to interpret out of it? If you want the structure of certain features and certain veins, 
if you decrease the resolution and go faster, you're still gonna you're gonna still get the the correct orientation from mm -hmm. a slightly grainier image. So it's all it's all about productivity and like what the purpose is. If you really want to zoom in on a specific feature, you go higher resolution and slower, it costs a little more. You know, uh, or you go for vast coverage and I want to know the big the big fractures and I can go at a slower uh, lower resolution, higher speed. So it's customizable. Yes. <coughs> Correct. Some things you can measure through casings. Some things you can't. Of that list that I showed you, mm -hmm. uh, some of the things uh, doesn't matter if the casing's there. It would have an influence. It may attenuate the signal a bit. Um, there's uh, there's acoustic techniques that can like see through PVC. There's um, you know, so it's a it's, it's mix and match. I wasn't trying to get into too many details, but that's a very good point. Uh, the condition matters. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what does this method give you? That looking at drill core, well, we could get this from non-core drill holes. So if you don't have, yeah, core, have a hole in the yeah. ground, yeah. yeah, yeah, oh yeah. no core. Correct. Yeah, I'm saying, what if what if you didn't? What if you want? To, what if you're in a situation where uh, you're not drilling core? You can get structural information. Yeah. The aperture of the front, I mean, yeah. in situ fractures, right? Rather than yeah, and sometimes yeah. you pull up a core box and it's all rubble and can really get a measurement. Uh, it can save you from the requirement of orienting your core because you're getting an oriented image. So you pick up the core box and this piece of core spun around and you know 360 degrees at whatever RPMs will we, we're actually measuring it knows which way it's going. So. And is the output in the, in the data format that you can actually put it to some of those uh, resource modeling software? Yes, yes we're working on that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah you can and we're working on ways to do it faster. Uh, we also just we will host a video like on your like on your smartphone or tablet. We've, we've created our own software just to make it easy for clients to look at their data. So we finish a borrow, we upload it to a site. You just click a link on your tablet and scroll through and look at the, the borrow. I can show you later. Um, anyway, so I showed you a little bit about about the data, the types of data we take, and now I'll talk a little bit about the analytical technique um, that we developed. And it doesn't really matter about our process. The idea is we extract value. From uh, so basically, it's a, you know, it's a robust data-driven technique. Um, so it's data-driven. So again, we're letting the data speak. So again, the data has to be consistent. So that's the big test we do. So it's uh, you know, obviously first thing, data validation. Right? So is a, we look at the data. Um, we have ways to um, basically highlight the flag, you know, <coughs> the data suspected, and then you have a human going and look at it and say, is this really anomaly? Like, is there something wrong with the data? Was there is there a problem with the data set? Or maybe this portal is just anomalous and everything's real. You check the calibration, everything checks out. So you make a decision at that point, you know, what stays in, what goes out. And uh, once you get past that point where, yeah, we're confident in this complete data set that we have, now we're going to you know, take advantage of some of the modern you know, big data techniques, uh, you know, neural networks, cluster analysis. And essentially, we're just we're doing two things primarily. There's a lot of other things to do, but the two things that we're really doing is we're classifying the rock into domains based on quantitative data. So that gets around, gets rid of all that subjectivity. You can still compare it to the core logging results, which is good. There's, there's some things you see in the core and some things you don't. Uh, so we're taking the multi-parameter data, in this case, you know, physical rock property information, and we're just binning it into domains. And we're, we're creating a class that, okay, everything in this class has has a very similar finger, <coughs> you know, very similar density, magnetic signature, uh, resistivity, chargeability, acoustic uh, velocity, all that kind of stuff. So we're able to characterize rock. And these physical rock properties, they relate to you know, many different things. I'll, I'll, I'll just jump into some examples um, so I don't run out of time. But, um, so that's one thing we do. The other thing we do is we turn it into the basis for proxy estimation. So when you think of those expensive tests that take a very long time, we start establishing relationships. So we get enough of those tests, and then we can say, wow, when we have this unique physical rock property signature across five or six parameters, it relates to you know this unit that clogs up the mill and you know, shuts things down. It's like, well, can we map this in 3D before we create the mine plan and avoid these pitfalls and events? Um, those are the types of things we can do. So I'll, I'll jump right into an example. So uh, instead of talking about it, we'll show you. Uh, we worked on this Dakar project. I was up. It's in DC. It's uh, First Point Minerals and uh, JV with Cliffs Natural Resources. Um, it's uh, an water rate deposit. Are you familiar with this? Um, so basically, it's uh, a naturally occurring uh, nickel iron alloy. Uh, it's got some unique properties. Um, so we acquired some some data uh, in situ. Um, skip a bit. We did some telework work for basically for understanding where the, the dikes, uh, the dike orientation and true thickness, that kind of stuff. But I'm going to focus on the physical rock property results. Um, 
the geology was, was pretty, you know, boring. It was like 90% veritite with varying degrees of serpentinization. Uh, the geochemistry was pretty consistent across the board. It was basically at the same geochemistry. It was almost homogeneous. Like everything across the board was very, very similar. Um, and the, the theory was that it was a closed system. So you have the same recipe ingredients, but forming into different minerals. So the same, you know, same ingredients forming into different things, which drove some pretty drastic physical rock property changes. So even though the geochemistry was the same, physical rock properties were different because the minerals were different. Okay. So we, there were about 69 boreholes drilled, 54 of them were surveyed. Sometimes so, you know, we lose access to the hole with the collapse or whatever, but in general, we had a pretty decent challenging conditions. We, we measured uh, you know, 54 boreholes uh, with these parameters. I'll show you right into the results here. So this uh, yellow color here, these are just bars showing the actual nickel in the ground. That's the total nickel. The green bars are the recoverable nickel. So they took all these, uh, you know, I think they're about three meter samples, and just ran it through and sort of did like a, you know, a mini sort of mill. They, they would grind it to a certain mesh size, magnetically separate it, and then do a density separation to extract the nickel. So you can see that even though the nickel's consistent, the rest, of, the rest of the nickel was in the burial site? Sorry? The, 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 the other nickel that was not recoverable was basically in the mineral in the burial site. Yeah, yeah, everything was in the yeah. Yeah, yeah. In, the, in the matrix. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So you're seeing that the variability is, is in the recoverability is very, very hot. You know, obviously, they, they're interested in they, you, know, you want to find the biggest area where you've got high recovery and avoid these low recovery areas because you're going to be digging this nickel out of the ground. It's going to scrape through the mill and you're not going to recover any of it. Mm -hmm. So this is very important. Go over here. This is the core log geology. So this is very challenging. Like the, the geology team there was very good. They knew what they were doing. They, 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 they're very consistent, uh, but basically it was, it was, it was, you just look at the rock and it all looks the same. The, 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 the serpentinization was changing a little bit, but it was all, all pretty tight with the eggs going through it. These are uh, geochemistry clusters or classes. So we took all the geochemistry and just broke it into classes. And most projects, you know, you, you, the domains kind of match the geology, but like I said, it's uniform, uniform geochemistry. There's very, no change in the uh, geochemistry. And the physical rock properties, these are basically us binning it into each color is, is a rock property class based on all this data. So you look at this data, there's some high variability. It's changing, and it actually maps to, so this red line is our prediction of what the recovery would be from these physical rock properties. So there's a pretty good correlation. Actually, you know, it's quite, quite good. So, uh, so we basically predicted it. Now we didn't use, that was that blind test. It was like going to a brand new hole and saying we're going to measure these parameters and we're going to predict what the recovery is. Uh, because we, uh, we had 54 boreholes, we trained the data on 52 of them, left two out, took those two boreholes, did the prediction based on what we learned from the other holes, and then imported the actual results from the, uh, from the GMAT testing. And we were able to get an R squared value of 0.92, which is pretty phenomenal. I don't think you can do much better than that, so we're, we're pretty happy with those results. But what's really interesting is the reason I got a silver bullet next to it here is like there's no silver bullet. If you break down the individual components, the highest correlation is magnetic susceptibility at 0 0.41. Our total prediction was 0.97. That's an R value, not an R squared, but magnetic susceptibility 0 0.41. So if if our client if called us and said, you know, just measure magnetic susceptibility, we know that this is a magnetic deposit, and we tried to look for a direct correlation between magnetic susceptibility and recovery, it never would have worked. Right? But 0.41 is not what I would call a success. In resistivity 0.35, and these are all really low. But all the, the power of having them all together really works. If you think about it, it makes sense. Like it's it's not a one-dimensional, one-parameter process when you're extracting it. It's, it's you know they're grinding it, they're magnetically separating it, they're doing density separation. It's a complex process to extract it out, and it makes sense. It takes more than one parameter. And I'm actually if I just flip back at it, uh, this plot. This low recovery zone has a different signature than this one. You notice this one's like got a low IP. This one has a high IP. So High resistivity, low resistivity. So there's two different non-recoverable zones, which is also why you can't just go with you know, one parameter. You need, you need all this information working together to basically uh, come up with a solution. So that's an example in the GeoMet world, and we were there for exploration reasons. Like we were, you know, it was, it was an early stage project, and we're actually adding value. And you think of the, uh, the implications here. Was it Jeff? Question? Or you just yeah, I, I just want to know how you got the geometallurgy out of all this. How did we do it? Yeah. Did, how did we get the, the values? Yeah. It was provided to us by the client. 
So from they did a bunch drill core. Yes, yes, yeah. Well, why don't you just put an XRF down the pipe and get chemistry that way? Well, the chemistry, uh, the, the chemistry was was consistent. No, but then you don't have to sample. Look, look. If you if you're drilling a bunch of drill cores across your property and interpolating between the drill cores, why can't you just do the chemistry of the borehole and interpret that, and now you know what your drill core chemistry is? The, the you're only interpolating across a drill core. You know the surface yeah. chemistry of the yeah. drill core. Yeah. You can interpolate the actual drill core chemistry. And if you know the drill core chemistry, then you could interpolate with the rest of the, the geology of it. You can interpolate from one drill core to another drill core. So why well, are we do this across the entire? No, but you're relying models. on them to run the drill. Core. That was that was to just train the data for the first time. Once you have that relationship. Then we can exploit it. We go to any new hole before. You know, this takes a long time for them to. Uh, we're relying on that source data to train, which now we're going to use what we know on any future holes going forward. I, I guess I'm just saying, why don't you just skip the? I mean, what what would prevent you from? I mean, you're interpolating drill cores across. I don't know, hundreds of meters or 100 meters yeah. or 50 meters. Instead, you're you need to interpolate across the drill core width, because if you know the chemistry of the drill core surface, yeah. you can interpolate across the drill core width, and then use that to interpolate the rest of the field. Why do you need to run chemistry? Why I, think, do I, I don't think that was his goal. Yeah. In the first of yeah. what we do in mining today, and then he's using it to <coughs> actually show that it's not enough. Yeah, but I, I'm just can putting you, out you, there why not just use drill core analyses directly, like throw the core away and yeah. use the borehole as your... Right, right, yeah, yeah, okay, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, you, you, could, you could do that. We're, this is like a, a test case where we're, we're proving that we can do it. I'm not trying to say now, what you're doing is bad, yeah. I'm just going one step further yeah, yeah, I got saying, you, I got you. Yeah, run an yeah, XRF yeah. on it, get the yeah. chemistry, yeah. and now Yeah, yeah. no, I get what you're saying, yeah, yeah. I wasn't clear on what you're asking. Yeah, the, the point moving forward is that a lot we can do with this. Because we have this knowledge, right. there's several things we can do. We can remote sense. We know the exact physical rock property signature to distinguish the uh, you know the recoverable from the non-recoverable stuff. So instead of slowly taking you know, 10 years to Swiss cheese the ground and find the sweet spot, you could run a few geophysical surveys, multi-parameter geophysical surveys, and like boom, let's drill here this year, like right in the biggest, sweetest spot that's got the high recoverability. Absolutely, you could use it in remote sensing. Uh, the other thing you could do is, okay, we've got enough core measurements, now we can uh, least expensive drilling method around that gives us an, an open something that's a third of cost of core drilling, right. and then boom, boom, okay, recoverable, non-recoverable, right. boom, let's go. Yeah, that, yeah that's, I get what you're saying, yeah. Let's listen. I think something oh, interesting sure. in your previous... Uh, yeah, this one? Uh, the one uh, before that. Oops. This one? In this, to, for me, yeah. uh, as a, I have some background in geophysics, what's interesting for me is that we go from what we do, all those big colorful things is what we do right now mm -hmm. in general, and, and you can tell that the human eye or the human brain is not capable of actually seeing a lot of differentiation. Exactly. Yeah. And it's also capable of, of, of synthesizing the information because um, if you look at uh, the geochemist, he's not a geologist. Exactly. So there's yeah. separate people yeah. providing information yes. that, and somebody has to put it together and understand it, mm -hmm. which is a problem today because mm -hmm. they don't talk the same thing. Yeah. What, uh, what the chargeability and, and, and so you go from a, a signal processing yeah. And then you get to a result that's actually yes. more integrated exactly. than human beings and their yes. own siloed specialties. Exactly. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Yeah. And, and we're also looking at information from the this is also gonna core, they're gonna have they're gonna have an understanding that, that you know I don't have. We're looking at what are these rock properties. So we're taking all these squiggles and reducing it to yes. these are the main units. <laughs> and then we've got geochemistry. I'll show you another project where the geochemistry tell shows you more than the physical properties. Because everything's different. So, but you have these, you're basically taking these silos and putting them together. What's the geochemistry telling us? What's the, you know, we can actually interplay them too. We could, we could predict geochemistry from the rock properties in some cases. Yes. And, and another <coughs> interesting, because I just came from uh, another side where mm -hmm. this is an issue, is the, like, the fact that we have silo groups. Yeah. Is the fact that people spend a lot of money on exploration, everybody's exploration is important. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But ultimately, it's the last picture. That we have to. I agree. I agree. So yeah. it's the yeah. value we get yeah. out of the first picture, which is how do you get yeah. from your exploration to actual value of how, how, what do you get out of the mill? 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
because it was structurally complex. They just wanted to understand the structure better. That's why we were there, uh, measuring quality to begin with. After that project was paid for, client was happy, the results were in, uh, everything's good. They decided at a later date to hire an engineering company to do a pitch shell design. And the, the engineering company said, well, we have to drill about 26 holes you know, all over the place, where we, there's already been a lot of drilling. So they could get the core and take the measurements and do the pitch shell design. They had no idea we had all this info. So we sent over this data and it changed everything. Um, the, the engineering company said, well, we don't have to drill 26 holes anymore. We need to drill like seven or eight, you know, which ended up saving a lot of money, but also time. Uh, the, on a desktop study, they came up with a preliminary pitch <coughs> because we had all the fractures, the open features, they knew what direction they were in. They did a preliminary pitch all design before a drill rig even showed up on the ground and they, they updated it once they, so they cut about nine months off the program and uh, out of an existing data set that was already paid for, a secondary application, they ended up saving about $4 million. Um, I'll stop there because, like I said, I can talk forever and I want to make sure that uh, I'm not going on too long. So, any questions? Well, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. One, why don't